Hi, everyone. Welcome to Elko Chats. My name is Julieta. Elko Chats is a regular podcast where we feature El Camino College alumni, students, staff, faculty, and managers across the campus. For today's episode, I get to chat with Daryl Thompson, an El Camino College English professor here at the college. Welcome, Daryl. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. First things first, you teach English. What do students call you? Is it Mr? Is it Professor? Is it Doctor? I'm not a doctor, so mm -hmm. definitely not that. Um, most common is Professor, probably, um, and sometimes just straight Thompson. Um, but I rarely get addressed, actually. They just kind of raise their hand and start talking. So, But uh, Professor is the most common, probably. And I really ask that question because I, I'm a first generation college student and I remember the first time one of my professors said, hey, by the way, you can call me Stacy. And that was odd and it was almost uncomfortable. I've always been accustomed to calling my teachers and professors by Mr. or Miss and their last name. So thank you for clarifying what the protocol is for you and the English classroom. So tell me a little bit more about yourself before we head into some of the other questions. Um, I am a first-generation student myself. Um, I was raised in the local area. I came to El Camino as a first-gen community college student. Um, struggled mightily. Um, took me several tries to change majors. Um, dropped out, came back. Um, and then about my fifth year, um, a switch flipped, and I was able to figure out what I really wanted to do. So kind of identifying my major was the real thing that kind of turned me around. Before that, I was just picking classes and floundering. I'm not sure I ever saw a counselor. Um, so once I was on target, I had the ability, but I didn't recognize I had the ability for a long time because I was so kind of rudderless. And now you're here teaching English for our students. Happily, yes. And so a lot of the conversation that I want to have with you today is about the first gen classroom experience, especially in an English class, because so many of our students do have to take English at some point while they're here at El Camino College. So tell me uh, about the first gen student. What is a first gen student and what's the importance of the first gen identity? Uh, here at El Camino, we define first gen as a student who neither parent nor guardian completed uh, a four-year degree in the, in the United States. Um, so that's why I land that way. Um, the second part of your question again? What's the importance of the first-gen identity? Oh, right. Um, I think it's twofold. I think, one, for the students to, ha to have that identity, to be able to name it and to recognize it, um, it gives them a sense of like ownership and acceptability of, I have this thing and... Um, it, I, can, I can use it to my advantage now. It's not just a negative. It's not deficit only. Um, for faculty, it's also useful because once we recognize it, um, we also can help them harness those skills that aren't necessarily traditional uh, college student skills. But using the grit that comes with being a first-gen student, um, using the sort of social capital that they bring, and learning how to employ those tools to their benefit as well. I like that. And when you say first gen student, I know you talked about parents not having degrees, but what if my sister has a college degree? Does that no longer make me a first gen student? By our definition, no. And I think by the national definition as well, it is um, the, the student him or herself. Um, a sister may have completed it, but she may still have not um, be because she didn't have all the tools. She might be able to help a little bit, but there's still that notion of every, every experience is a little bit different. So they may not be able to help as much as a, a parent who went through it and who has the financial part as well. And I wanted to talk about the first gen experience for a number of reasons. Um, and over half of the students here at El Camino College are first gen students. We ask a question similar to this in the admissions application and we're able to look at that data. But tell me a little bit more about the first gen student experience at El Camino College. What are some of those norms and expectations placed on the college student that first-gen students have to learn to navigate? I think a lot of it happens with application and all that, but that's not really my area. But um, as I kind of alluded to, for me, it was identifying my major. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the idea that everybody else has got it together and knows where they're going and knows what they're doing isn't really the case. And to see everybody else or to believe everybody else is doing that makes makes the, the first-gen student maybe feel a little bit misplaced. Um, we call it imposter syndrome. In the classroom, it's um, 
like it happens now. Like I, when I start to lecture, I almost have to tell my students like now's the time to take notes. I picked up my marker. Um, now's note taking time. So there's just little norms like that that they're not accustomed to. That they don't know when to start t taking notes. Um, they might be um, uncomfortable with the professor experience. They don't know what to call me. Uh, they um, are nervous to approach me or come to my office hours. So there's some of that stuff that. And like I said, part of what we do when we're conscious of it is try to mitigate those things, right? So I try to make my office hours um, clearly apparent and available so they know what they're for and they know that they can come take advantage of that resource. What are office hours? Uh, they're the times that we set aside so that um, our students can come see us. They can come with concerns about an assignment, uh, readings that they're not comfortable with. Uh, sometimes they just come to chit chat uh, just because they are getting comfortable and they want to talk. Um, especially towards the end of the semester, like they'll pop in and like say bye and then they end up sitting for a half hour and doing that kind of stuff. I had a student come in this week, in fact, and he had uh, struggled with an assignment and he sat there for a half hour and like we talked about our high school experiences and family and we were both from the same neighborhoods and stuff. So it was kind of cool. And so you don't know this unless students come to your office hours. So why should they come to your office hours? Uh, well, sometimes I learn it in the classroom too. I have a, I do try to open up classroom space for those kind of discussions. Um, but in the office time, it's just me and the students. So they may not want to share with other students. So there's stuff like that that they might not want to reveal. Um, and it's, I think just, you know, the, the ability to let me to get to know the student, right? It's, it's, it's one thing that they know me, but it's also important to them that I know them. Um, they may need a letter of rec later on. Um, or down the road, they might want some kind of reference for a scholarship. And um, if I don't remember who they are, if they didn't make an impression because they were quiet at the back of the class, um, those opportunities are going to be limited. And I think that's why I really wanted to bring up office hours, because especially for first gen students where the entire college experience can be a little bit intimidating, ensuring that, you know, these opportunities are available for all students and taking advantage is important because of what the, the benefits that come with that. So now um, most students at El Camino will take an English class at some point. We prefer that they take these English classes at the very first year of their time here at El Camino College. Now, whether a student is a recent high school graduate or it's been years since they've enrolled in any class anywhere, what do you think is the biggest surprise or the toughest hurdle in the English college classroom? Uh, I think there are two, um, and I, I'm experiencing them right now with my students, in fact. Um, one is just the workload, they're usually surprised by the workload and the pacing of it. Um, a uh, student that came in the other day was talking about how 12th grade, he had it nailed, he was just breezing through classes, everything was cool, got good grades, and he said, like, right now I'm getting, well, he came in cocky, he said, and right now he's learning quickly that the, the high school stuff didn't necessarily fit. Um, so that, that time management, you know, they had six classes, now they have four, they feel like it's going to be easier and they just don't recognize how much is put on the student in college is not done in the classroom. Um, the other thing is just uh, like sometimes the intensity of their work, like I'm, they have to read a couple of novels in my class or at least book length works and um, completing the work is really important to getting the essay done and I mean completing the reading is really important to get the essay done and so just the, the, the volume of the work that comes at them. Um, I think also uh, kind of catches them off guard. I think many times students enroll in a class not realizing that for every one college unit that you're enrolled in, you're probably expected to do two hours of homework. And homework looks in many different ways, whether that's writing an essay or reading a book, it's all a part of homework. So tell me- a Can I say a little bit about homework real oh, quick? Yeah. So I th the other thing that they learn, I, I believe, is like in high school, they get homework assignments, mm -hmm. right? And they have these sheets that they turn in at the end of the day or book work that they turn in the next day or whatever. And um, they constantly, not constantly, often will ask, like, what is our homework? And I go, we're working on an essay. It's due in two weeks. You're going to have a novel that's going to be due the week after that. What is your homework, right? So it's, it's them figuring out that they have to figure out what they need to do rather than me telling them, it's not you should read page chapters one through three of such and such because – it's just not paced out that way. We're going to start the book when we start the book. And so you have to know that and be ready for that. And there's something else that you also provide, well, every professor, right, provides 
college students on the very first day that also serves as a guide, mm -hmm. right, for homework. So of tell course. me a little bit about what that the is. The syllabus? Yep. Yeah, the, the contract for the class. Yep. Uh, yeah, so the, the students, they see it. It's, it's the same thing. They see it and they're exposed to it. Um, and then it's not till week three or four that they realize that it's meaningful, like there's reality in it, right? Um, the first day it is full of promise and everybody's all excited about the semester and starting anew. First major assignments come to do about week three or four, and that's when they start to realize, oh, I need to know these policies. Mm -hmm. What are the late policies of this professor? What are the office hours of this professor? And so it, it, it becomes that document that they have to refer to constantly um, to, to stay abreast of their different professors' expectations, uh, requirements, demands, etc. But again, for somebody who's never been, who's in the first in their family to go to college, just the word syllabus, what is that? What does that look like? So I appreciate you telling me a little bit like, oh, by the way, this is a very important document. I think they remember them from high school, but that syllabus was between the parent and the student. I mean, the parent and the teacher more often, right? Mm -hmm. Like the parent had to sign. I remember signing for my kids, their, their syllabus going, yes, I understand that I'm holding my child responsible for these things, but mm -hmm. um, now it's on the student for sure. And then when you mentioned that one of the biggest surprises for the first gen college student is that time management, I think going back to the syllabus to plan ahead, right? What are those assignments that you're going to have the entire semester and, and making sure that that time is set aside. The student that was in my class the other day, I, I asked him if he had a planner in my office the other day. I asked him if he had a planner and he goes, yeah. And, he, and I was like, well, what about it? And he goes, I've never used it, but I'm going to start. So, mm -hmm. um, but again, having that conversation and kind of guiding him, um, whereas a student whose parents have done this might be ready to roll already or might know, okay, these things are important. And it's important to know too that a lot of our students are part-time students. And many times it's because they don't have the time available to enroll in full-time classes because they're either working or they're caring for somebody else and they don't have that time. So I think making it clear in terms of what those expectations are, how much writing there will be in the English classroom and how much um, reading there will be is important to know ahead of time. With homework, what are the different types of support that's available for students who are looking for some support with their homework? For English. For English in particular, yeah. we have an outstanding reading and writing studio. We just changed the name of it. It's newly inaugurated. Um, and in there, you can go, no matter what class you're in, if you have a writing assignment for poli sci or anthro or whatever, um, you can go in there with an assignment at the very beginning stages, and they help you develop your ideas. You can go in um, with an outline, and they'll help you flesh it out. You can go in with a draft, and they'll give you feedback to make it better. Um, I, in my class, give my students a 5% bump on their essay grade if they go to the writing center and if I can see the changes and they took the advice of the tutor that's in there. Um, there's a lot of other, tu there's a tutoring center mm -hmm. with uh, tutorials, I'm um, sorry, tutoring for all kinds of other classes. Uh, and I can't remember if there's a reading one or not. Is there still a reading? There's a yeah. learning resource <laughs> yeah, center yeah. <laughs> with uh, tutoring support for many different subjects. And I think it's important that you bring that up because you know, going back to that first gen student and feeling less than, mm -hmm. feeling not quite ready, not quite the college material, the support is there to be used. And sometimes they're not ready to use it. They're nervous. They're like, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to, like, you know, my peers aren't using it or the, it, it might be kind of stigmatized. Mm -hmm. So it's also something that I've always tried to do. That's why I give the 5% is, is to say, no, we all get, you know, aid somehow. We all get aid somewhere. We all, all need some sort of support, yeah. some sort of help. I wear glasses, right? I mean, it, it's not bad that I wear them. It, it makes you be able to see. What, it's helpful. It, I take advantage of those things. I want to go back a little bit to the office hours because I think it's one of those skills that if you don't develop it here at El Camino where we're somewhat smaller of a college and you have so much access to professors and counselors, developing the skill here for those students who want to transfer will just set you up for success where you're going what's that first conversation if if i'm a college student first gen student not sure why i am going to office hours what's the suggestion for a first conversation i don't know i guess first time you need help um i think that's when i started using them it's when i just realized i was i didn't get a grade i wanted or i wasn't clear about an assignment so it was just a matter of me deciding like i i want to fix this i want to mm -hmm. i want to make up for this or whatever I got to do to make it better. So um, if there's like 
an opportunity. Like I used to try to give extra credit for students that came to my office hours. It didn't work except for those who would have come anyway, I think. Um, but I, I invite them in for all kinds of conversations. So I don't know if there's a particular inroad that I have in mind, but did you have one? <laughs> No, I, I don't think I ever visited anybody's office hours when oh, I was at LA. I got pretty good at it once I transferred. I didn't do it a lot here, but... When I transferred, I yeah. eh, I didn't really get good at it. I, I saw the graduate student instructors, but mm -hmm. I didn't really see the faculty much. So, oh. yeah, so that's why I, I wanted to bring that up because I think that's one of those skills that's definitely going to help you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, learn to navigate that now. I have a colleague who makes her students write her emails at the beginning of the semester. To get used to the dear so and so, I'm in this class. This is my concern, rather than the emails we sometimes get, which is, "Hey, can I have my quiz reopened?" Right, without, and without knowing what class you're in or what assignment you're talking about or whatever. So, and these are these norms and expectations exactly. that we're placing on college students that they right. don't know that these are the norms and expectations until you're going through it. Correct. So. As an English professor, and you're very well um, knowledgeable on the first-gen student experience at El Camino College, and I appreciate all the work that you do for the first-gen students. So what's the most rewarding part about your job? Oh, easily the students. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, <laughs> um, you, you, you go into this career because, you know, you're, you're, you you want to make change. And you want to impact the world and the students and whatnot. And then um, so that, that intrinsic value that, that is really rewarding just – I start students and they have these skills and by the end of the semester their skills are stronger mm -hmm. the next semester i see them they're they're thriving eventually some of them are coming back here to work <laughs> so just watching all the progress that happens and and the growth um and how transformative it is it is which is why i chose this level um i, I saw that this was the place where i could make I believe i can make the biggest difference and have the biggest impact um but i also get to see the growth in ways that i'm not sure you would see with a junior level college student like it, to me this is just where that the bigger leaps happen right so especially if they're coming in um first gen unprepared all those things that we sort of do to call students when they're not yet ready for the real college experience although i always say my classroom is real college absolutely it really is so now thinking about those who might be thinking about coming to el camino college what advice do you have for somebody who's thinking about applying to el camino uh, definitely do it. It's a great place to to transform yourself. You can come and take classes at a relatively inexpensive rate or for free if you're in South Bay Promise um, and explore classes. Um, I, again, don't like the rush that people have to pick majors so you can take some time, learn, get into a few different classes, figure out where your strengths are, figure out where you might want to grow. Um, so I think it has a lot of like that fulfillment part that can sort of transform a student as well. Um, and then it's just a home for everybody. We, we have a great diverse population. When I was a student here, the thing that I loved about it was how diverse the population was. Um, I just, I couldn't see myself at a different campus because I just, I appreciated that so much. Um, and we're <clears throat> bursting with services. We have programs galore. We have support services. We have food services. We have it all. So there's like no way that a student would come here and, and not be able to survive or to thrive even, I think. There's just so much support. It's, it's, it makes it harder to um, not do well. And we have wonderful professors like yourself <laughs> uh, who are just prepared to support our students, very knowledgeable on the first-gen experience, proudly wearing your first-generation T-shirts. So thank you so much for coming in with me and, and chatting about the first-gen college experience uh, in an English classroom. All right. Thanks again for having me. It was great. Thank you.